Hello everyone, it's great to see you again. Uh, welcome to another Game Camp webinar. Today's webinar will be dedicated to the hyper casual, discussing the trends in design and growth. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you know that that the content we will have today will be really interesting for you uh, to to grow your knowledge in that uh, uh, specific topic. Uh, let's invite our uh, uh, amazing guests uh, guest today. So let's invite uh, Constantino Carrego Bertolini. Who is head of publishing at Boombit? Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Hello, Constantino. Then uh, Pedro Cabacao, who is founder of uh, Vault Games. Hi, guys. Hello, Pedro. And Heba Gurguis, who is product and partnership manager at Boombit. Uh, Hello. And uh, uh, let's invite Mateusz Bochenczak, uh, who is he gaming growth manager at Google. Hey, how are you? Uh, as always, uh, 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 feel free actually to, to join us uh, at Slido. Uh, if you have any questions, you would like to add some discussion points, please add them via, uh, via Slido because that, that gives uh, uh, other people opportunity to vote on, on those questions and those discussion topics. And of course, uh, we'll be able to uh, discuss those topics either during the session or uh, after all those uh, three presentations. So just go to the Slido and then enter Game Camp to join that uh, specific uh, discussion. Uh, so with that, uh, let's, uh, let's of course start with our first uh, uh, presentation. So let's invite to the stage uh, uh, Constantino, who will be talking about uh, what kind of trends can we see in the hyper casual and what's actually the direction this trend are going to. Uh, Constantino, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. You can see my slides well? All good? Yes. OK, awesome. All right, uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Constantino. Uh, as I was just introduced, I'm a head of uh, publishing for the hypercasual depart department in Boombit. Uh, I've been in the hypercasual industry for about uh, two years and recently joined Boombit. Uh, very excited to, uh, to talk to you uh, today about uh, the biggest trends uh, in hypercasual markets today. Uh, so here we go. Uh, first of all, a quick agenda of what I will be discussing today. So I will be talking about the evolution of hypercasual uh, in terms of market, but also in terms of uh, everything related to the product itself, how games have changed uh, since uh, its boom in, the, in 2018, I would say that's most uh, relevant here and when really uh, hypercasual started to take off uh, to its most recent trends in 2020, now almost 2021. Uh, and uh, and then yeah, and then we'll be also talking about all the different trends inside the game and the future uh, for uh, for hyper casual and what's to come. Uh, so quick uh, quick um, introduction to to Boombit and to our company that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, so uh, Boombit started in 2014 as a free to play and hyper casual uh, developing company. Uh, with a number of games. Uh, at the time, Hypercasual still wasn't a, a name that was really broadly used, uh, with one of the major successes uh, being Dancing Line that was published with uh, Cheetah Games. Uh, afterwards, the company uh, shifted towards more uh, casual uh, mid-core types of games like Tanks A Lot and Idle Coffee Corp. Uh, after that, uh, we're landing in 2019, so more recently, uh, with the debut on the Varso Stock Exchange. Uh, and since then, uh, the company decided to really focus on hypercasual again, uh, starting Q4 2019, with uh, some already major hits such as uh, Ramp Car Jump and uh, Slingshot Stunt Driver that arrived respectively in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we have today uh, more than 100 million downloads uh, in, in this year. I should update my slide because it's actually more than 150 million now. Uh, and part of it, more than 35 million, 40 million. Uh, that have to be assigned to ramp card jump alone. Um, so, uh, as mentioned before, I will kind of take you through the evolution of the hyper casual market and how it changed uh, since it's uh, again booming in 2018 to today. So, if we go look at most downloaded apps, uh, free apps in 2018, especially, uh, we will find some very familiar uh, hyper casual games for many of you. Uh, so uh, here we have three of them uh, you might be familiar with. Uh, so 
I would say there were two main uh, genres of games at the time. There were uh, puzzle and arcade games. Uh, here, respectively, you have uh, the two first ones are two arcades, and the last one being more puzzle. Uh, the Obviously, the market was different as well, as we had uh, a lot less uh, publishers. Uh, probably uh, you can divide the number of hyper casual publishers that we have today to mine, like divided by 10 or divided by 20 easily. Uh, the art style and development complexity of those games was much simpler as well. Uh, for example, many games would be in 2D very often. Uh, and uh, when it was in 3D, uh, it would be abstract 3D shapes. So quite uh, not as complex as the games we have today. And I will discuss that later with you guys. Uh, also, there were less games for sure, but bigger in number of downloads, definitely, um, with um, with games that would easily get uh, hundreds of millions of downloads, which is quite impressive, and numbers that we don't see as easily these days. Uh, and the monetization of those games was mainly interstitial based, uh, while nowadays this has uh, changed a lot, as I will be showing to you later. So since what happened? Um, the the market for hyper casual games increased incredibly uh, as you can see here for example for non-organic installs for hyper casual games uh, jumping 250 percent on a year to year growth uh, and um, so that's uh, that's quite impressive numbers especially when compared to the rest of the mobile game industry uh, which as we all know is still increasing incredibly uh, every year um, and uh, so yeah basically a couple of years later to after 2018 uh, where are we now in terms of the market and the way it looks? So there is now a much larger variety in terms of genres of games. Uh, so as I was mentioning before, it was mainly puzzle and uh, arcade games. Now we have a lot more such as what we could call ultra casual ASMR games. So basically based on very uh, satisfying uh, inputs uh, such as uh, painting nails, um, like uh, peeling fruits, etc. Then we have uh, simulation games that are very popular at the moment, where you would, uh, you know, like play as a cop or as a teacher, etc. And uh, trivia games as well that are quite uh, quite popular. So there's a lot more inside hypercasual, with some genres that were before more outside of hypercasual, that joined more uh, the hypercasual uh, business model. Uh, the market also became hyper competitive uh, compared to before. So we, as mentioned, we had just a few publishers. Now there is a lot more and same goes for studios. Uh, also, those studios change quite a bit. Uh, we, uh, in terms of language as well, we used to uh, talk a lot more about developers because very often it would just be, uh, you know, developers by themselves uh, creating hyper casual games. Nowadays, uh, you have full on big studios working on that. And I'm sure Pedro will explain more about that uh, after me. Um, and then also in terms of games themselves, uh, they became a lot more complex in terms of depth, in terms of art and physics, in terms of uh, themes that are being added to the games. Uh, but we also get some simpler gameplays as well. So the variety is just increasing in both directions. Uh, as mentioned, uh, ultra casual ASMR games uh, are increasing a lot. Uh, and were increasing, especially during the past two years. Um, and there, for example, sometimes the gameplay is extremely simple, just as peeling a fruit, right? But uh, that's also one of the directions that the hyper-casual market has taken in order to reach even further in terms of audience. Uh, so what's happening as well is that there are a lot more games uh, in, uh, in the charts and regularly new ones coming, and they're staying for less time in the charts. Uh, so uh, retention rate obviously has uh, been sacrificed in the last years. Uh, we don't have games with uh, retention rates uh, like or very rarely above the 50, 60 percent threshold. Uh, and uh, all publishers and studios have been focusing a lot on CPI in order to be attractive for the market and in order to scale. Uh, and as well, uh, compared to before, where it was mainly interstitial based, uh, hyper casual is shifting towards more RV and IAP uh, monetization based. Uh, and uh, this is for sure something as well that we'll be discussing later in terms of uh, where the future of hyper casual is going. Uh, so now focusing a bit more uh, in terms of today and uh, what do we have uh, in terms of trends, what is working. Uh, and how have we, we have like accumulated knowledge from the past to to today? 
Um, so here you have a few genres uh, that I mentioned as well earlier. Uh, so for sure, um, I, what I would say now is that hypercasuals never had so many genres in the charts at the same time. Uh, there's many different ones that are being new trends that are arriving every every year, every month, almost every week uh, when talking about hypercasual, uh, and very uh, a very small number of uh, genres that are losing attractiveness on the market. So, for example, one that now is very strong for sure is role play simulation types of games, as I mentioned before, where you're either a teacher or a cop or a barista. This kind of uh, this kind of games, for example, uh, we're basically uh, mimicking real life uh, types of mechanics. Uh, and what distinguishes them as well is that they're usually uh, multi-mechanic based. Uh, so it's a lot of mini games um, that are, uh, yeah, that create one overall game. Uh, what's interesting as well with that is that for sure, uh, this would, would not be easy for a single developer as it used to be more in, uh, uh, in the past years. Now you need bigger studios in order to be able to build games that contain multiple mechanics inside. Uh, as mentioned before as well, ultra casual ASMR games, still strong growth and still uh, very present uh, in the top charts. Uh, used to be a huge trend about a year ago, uh, but now still still there, still happening re regularly with uh, though the difference being that now there needs to be slightly more attention towards the quality uh, of those games as it's more difficult to stand out compared to all everything that's been tried in terms of uh, satisfying ASMR uh, visuals. Uh, action arcade games, they they were there at the start and they're still very strong today. Uh, some publishers even being uh, almost entirely focused on this genre. It's one that always works, uh, that gets always a lot of downloads and is strong both in terms of CPI and retention. Uh, trivia and puzzle games still very stable. Uh, as uh, as I was saying earlier, puzzle was there since the very start of hypercasual, and it's still here nowadays. Uh, so still um, a strong genre that is still always present in the charts. And then another one that is that we could almost call like a subgenre inside those genres, which is uh, audience or subject based. Uh, so this is very interesting as uh, hypercasual has for a long time been thought as only uh, type of uh, market where you should attract to like try to attract all types of users. Uh, but what has been realized by studios and publishers later on is that there is enough, the audience is big enough to still have some games that are audience based. Like, for example, here we have an example of a more male oriented and female oriented games. Uh, and those, since the market is so huge, are still able to get very low CPIs at scale uh, on, the, on a very large audience anyway. Uh, one genre that maybe has been slightly less present uh, in, in in the top charts and in very much in the hyper casual uh, type of uh, um, type of idol, uh, which is not as uh, as strong as it used to be. Uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, you would have idol games regularly uh, in the top ten uh, very often. Now it happens slightly less often, but still, these are games that have very uh, strong traction in terms of LTV and are still very successful just slightly less trendy than at the time. Uh, so that was for genres. Uh, moving on more to towards mechanics, so slightly more in-depth. Uh, for sure, a lot of the good old mechanics that were there since the start are still working very well. Uh, the swerve, swipe, tap timing, press and release, uh, all that kind of stuff is working and keeps working, just being, you know, like reskinned for different themes, different art style. Uh, but now there, in the last year for sure as well, there have been a lot of innovations uh, also uh, linked to new technologies that are available uh, on Unity or for mobile phones. Uh, so for example, drawing mechanic has been very strong in the past year with uh, many different games uh, using it and exploring it in different ways. Uh, many of these have been in the top charts regularly. Uh, sorting, untangling as well has been very strong. Uh, and this, for example, is linked to new possible things uh, on Unity. Uh, and then as well, for example, typing, which was uh, kind of a recent one. Uh, it was very, very successful and a very interesting one as well and hadn't been explored before. Um, moving on to the art part. Uh, here again, uh, as, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, hypercasual used to be very basic, abstract art style, uh, very simple, uh, no, no artistic direction, uh, nothing like that. 
uh, but now, uh, for sure, in the past year, two years, uh, it's starting to get more and more importance, uh, the art cell, and uh, for sure, quality matters more and more. Uh, so, for example, something that is uh, quite recent and uh, having a lot of uh, success lately is a kind of realistic art cell. Uh, so here you have a few examples of that. Uh, those are all classic hyper-casual uh, hyper publishers, including ourselves with a uh, ramp car jump here. Uh, so this style, for example, is working very well now. Uh, and in the same way, some games that might have done been done more in an abstract way a year ago with the Stickman now are starting to get more expressive characters with a cartoonish look in order to attract uh, more users and get lower CPIs. Uh, in terms of themes as well, that's a big shift um, compared to, to what we had uh, before in uh, in hyper casual. Uh, so again, we went from completely unthemed kind of games with just 3D uh, balls bouncing on platforms. Uh, and now it's becoming uh, a lot more, uh, a lot closer to that. So people are looking at themes that are working in social media, on Netflix and whatnot. Uh, and this is a new way to attract users as well. So uh, sometimes reskins of games with the with a good theme can attract a lot of users. So here, for example, you can see a barista, a pregnancy, and a ninja, an emoji game. Uh, so these are these themes are much stronger than pure abstract shapes. But at the same time, what publishers and studios are making sure they're doing uh, is to keep those themes very relatable. Uh, so all these uh, have still a very broad audience. It's still dangerous, I would say, to this day in hyper casual uh, to try to go, you know, into uh, cyberpunk uh, type of games uh, and etc. Also, today being a special day about that. Um, so, um, yeah, moving on to hyper casual and uh, the future. So, of course, that's a, a big question everyone has, uh, including because of uh, IDFA and the uncertain future uh, of hyper casual, even though we're all sure it's still going to be there. Um, so uh, basically, a lot of people have been talking about hybrid casual, right? Uh, which is this mysterious genre that many people are labeling differently. Uh, many people have talked about Archero as being a hybrid casual game. Uh, us in Boombit don't necessarily see Archero as the as hybrid casual and as how it will develop uh, really, uh, in the sense that it still uses some themes. Uh, from like more uh, medieval fantasy type of uh, of art, uh, which still is not necessarily what appeals to all of the um, hyper casual audience. Uh, but what we think hybrid casual is for sure is those games that are going to have still very uh, broad themes, such as uh, pregnancy, such as uh, uh, emojis, etc. As mentioned before, uh, but with a lot more depth in order to get uh, much higher LTVs. Uh, as well, what's going to be part of that strategy is to focus a lot more on IAPs uh, because they will get a lot of importance, uh, especially considering as well the potential impact of a DFA. Uh, so yeah, that was for, for my part. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have uh, any question, I don't know if it's already now the time or for, for later. Anyway, I'll give you guys back. Hey. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much uh, for you. running us, us through trends. Um, one question uh, from my side, especially when you discussed you know, the journey from 2018 to 2020, uh, when we talk about the actual markets. So 2018 definitely was US-centric when it comes to hyper-casuals. But what we saw over the, in our data over the last uh, two years that the share of downloads um, almost decreased uh, from uh, EU and US. Uh, and the winners, the emerging winners is India, Brazil, or APAC emerging markets. And I wonder um, if you also see that and, and how do you perceive that from the business perspective? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So yeah, we 100% see that as well. Uh, and we, we need to consider that very closely. Uh, for sure, India and China need to be, uh, to be taken into consideration, especially. Uh, what, what we believe is that uh, US is still very strong today and uh, in terms of uh, pop culture as well, it still dictates uh, kind of to uh, globally. So if we say make a game that is attractive to the US audience, there's good chances that's going to work globally. 
Um, and uh, of course, I mean, we all know as well that the uh, the monetary value of uh, of users in the US is very high. Uh, so it's still part of, uh, it's still a big focus in terms of business model. Uh, but for sure as well, what we need to consider and uh, also following what I was uh, uh, mentioning earlier in terms of IEPs, IEPs are gonna take more and more uh, importance and for sure, the number of downloads will be more and more relevant in that sense as well. Uh, so for sure, uh, India and China will be, uh, and other uh, other geos, of course, will be more and more uh, in our focus. And the games we build should really appeal to every 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 geo, pretty much. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Constantino. And of course, stay with us, uh, like till the end, so that we'll have like much much longer and, and deeper discussion around the topic. Uh, for now, let's let's invite our second speaker. And of course, uh, please remember, like everyone, that you can join the the discussion at Slido. Please join the Slido and actually add questions there. And now let's invite our second uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Pedro Cabacao, who is like founder of the company Doing that actually does the uh, hyper casual games. And, and he will talk about art and science behind the hyper, hyper casual hit games from his perspective as, as, as like uh, someone who found the company and is actually uh, doing such uh, such 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 games. Uh, Pedro, the stage is yours. Thank you, Marius. Um, nice to be here. Thank you for for the invite. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit behind uh, about the art and science uh, behind uh, developing hyper casual games. Um, First of all, let me introduce a little bit uh, myself. So I'm 24 years old uh, with a huge passion for, for video games in general. Um, I have a computer science background, um, having a master's degree here in Lisbon. Uh, I am the CEO and developer uh, at Volt Games, 50% of the time CEO managing the company uh, and 50% of the time doing what uh, is my biggest passion at the moment, which is uh, creating games. Uh, I released my first game in mobile when I was 13 years old. Um, and around three years ago, I, uh, I released Super Crossbar Challenge, which got over 1.5 million organic downloads being featured by Apple uh, in new games we love uh, and in the Google Play Store as well. Over the past 11 years, I managed to work on over 70 games. Um, so a big experience there. Uh, of course, some of these games were uh, very, very simple back when I was uh, way younger, but uh, still a good number. Uh, so here, just a comparison of... Uh, the first game I worked on, which is called Dodgemon, uh, when I was 13 years old, around 11 years ago. Uh, very simple game. The game back then was paid, so it was 99 cents to download. And in one day, in the first day, it got over 300 downloads, so 300 paid downloads. And you might think, okay, that's cool for, for a 13-year-old to, to get 300 paid downloads. But back then, I was just so blind that I thought that uh, I would wake up the next day of the release and see, like, hundreds of thousands of downloads. But uh, this that didn't happen of course and that this just goes to show how less competitive the market was back then because i think it's pretty clear for everyone that if uh, someone releases a paid game for 99 cents nowadays to get 300 organic downloads is almost unthinkable especially with uh, the art style and the look and the gameplay that this game had which was just uh, bad and on the right you can see just a quick screenshot uh, of, the, of the game super crossbar challenge which got over 1.5 million downloads um, very good uh, for, for myself personally, um, so so yeah. Now on to, the, to today's agenda, so first of all, I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about Volt Games and how we operate, our, our prototypes. Then uh, answer two questions that I was asked uh, for this presentation, was which essentially is what is needed to create a good hyper-casual game, and then what increases the probability of success uh, for, for these titles. Let's start with uh, Volt Games. Um, so Volt Games was founded in January 2020, Around 11 months ago, we are four co-founders. So it's myself, uh, Gonzalo Banya, which is the COO, João Kerk, which who is the, the CTO, and Pedro Dinish, who is the CPO. Gonzalo and João, I met them uh, at my computer science uh, course uh, in college. And Pedro, I met, I met him because I challenged him for a quick cup of coffee uh, when he was at, uh, at Miniclip. Um, so yeah, we are the four co-founders. And in five months, we, we managed to, to grow to 11 people. So. We hired seven people ranging from game designers, artists, to developers. Um, as you might have guessed, we, we work on the mobile games development industry. Um, in the beginning, we started in hyper-casual and over the, 
over the next few months, we did we, we did stay there 100%. But over the past two months, we we decided to also create a small team focused on creating and growing uh, casual games, uh, more specifically sports games. Uh, but yeah, now the, the the operations, the way we operate, so we, we are used to in the hyper casual space to work uh, in different types of stages. So we have done CTR videos to test the CTR in order to validate concepts. We have worked on CPI builds just to get fast results. They want retention builds to test gameplay and content. At this moment, we are averaging around six hyper casual prototypes per month um, being developed uh, besides um, one or two in-house projects for the more casual titles. And in the past 11 months, we've managed to work on over 40 games. Uh, these are just some screenshots for some of the prototypes we, we've worked on or are working on at the moment. On the left, you can see Agent Bullet, a hyper-casual game, shooting meets parkour, very action, fast-paced uh, game. Uh, then a football prototype we're working on um, with a more uh, clean and polished art style. This is one of the one of those casual titles I was I was mentioning before. And then a basketball game, still very initial, but uh, just a quick screenshot of, of the visuals there. And on the right, Perfect Fighter, a hyper casual title, which I will, I will talk a little bit more in depth a little bit, a little bit later on. So uh, what is needed to create a good hyper casual game? So as you might guess, there's no formula for the success here. There's no right thing to do when you immediately get immediately strike success but i think there's a few things that uh, developers and studios can do in order to to create better titles um so at, at vault games we we got ourselves from these three principles so ideation process the art style and the execution level um we think that getting a good mixture of these three allows for a, a better prototype at the end um so starting with the ideation process so what do we do in order to 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 get better ideas out, get better and more ideas out there. So initially, uh, we, we we follow the top charts. I think as everyone else in the industry does to see what's trending, what's working in terms of gameplay, in terms of uh, trends, in terms of art style, everything. So we play the games, and I say here a whole no because I mean, we're all in this industry because I think we all love games in general. So as if playing games is is a burden, uh, it's not. Um, Follow hyper casual social media pages. So there's quite a few pages out there, both on Instagram and on YouTube, that share the most recent um, hyper casual titles out there. So Store Glide on Instagram, very useful, three, four games per day, the most recent ones, and New Games Daily on YouTube, one of my favorite ones, uh, also releases like five or six games, uh, shows uh, five or six games that have been released by talented uh, developers. As, as all, all, almost every other studio and publisher does, we also use a lot of App Annie, Sensor Tower, and Coda Platform to get the sense of what's working in the top charts, analytics, new releases. Uh, Coda Platform spe specifically is very useful for us because um, you can see the most recent releases as well, see what's trending in terms of the top charts, as well as the, the mechanics like puzzle, arcade, action, what's working. Uh, we implemented brainstorm sessions uh, around two months ago. Every, every two weeks, we have a quick brainstorm session of around one hour where we just get the whole team together. Um, and we, during one hour, just pump out concepts and discuss them. And I, initially, I thought that this wouldn't be that productive. But uh, it did prove to be quite good for the team. So in one hour, we managed to put, to put out uh, two to four uh, concepts that are, are, are pretty, pretty interesting. Um, then we also follow a lot of the trends on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. We see what's working and what's not, uh, what might be possible to bring to, to hyper casual as a game. We, we've seen this with games like tie-dye, soap cutting, um, and others. So very interesting here to see these trends. And even as, as Constantino mentioned, even Netflix can serve as, as uh, an inspiration. And then after all of these uh, steps, and once we have an idea, we just we just come up with a quick game design document with the gameplay, the theme, and the controls details. Just two quick pages uh, with, with these uh, items detailed. The art style, um, of course, we as as the ideation process, we take a lot of references from what's working on the on the top chart games, um, and and then we also guide ourselves for for bright colors. So don't go for dark colors, but also don't go for too bright. There's a, a big internal debate in the team uh, between abstract and more detailed art. Um, as Constantino is also mentioning, there's uh, we we can make this decision based also on the concept. Uh, abstract art style being more one color stick man, very little amount of colors, um, abstract themes, and then detailed art, you, you can make like skins for your characters, 
uh, themes like forest, city, etc. So there's also this big debate every time we, we start working on a game. Um, every time a, a game is is meant to be to begin its development, we we have a, a quick kickoff session with the developer, the artist, and the game designer to see um, what we will be working on. Um, and at Vault, we decide to always, uh, after the, the game design uh, document has been done, we decide to begin with the art style, and only after we decide to do the implementation. This way, the artist can, can alongside the game designer, think the game a little bit better, so that when the developer picks up on the game, it's easier for him to pick up. Um, I also suggest not having too many elements on the scene and in your game, so that the focus is purely on the gameplay. And as you can see here, we have two examples of two games we've worked on in the past. The one on the left, very simple color scheme, um, not too many elements, and the other one on the right as well, just a, a quick uh, a C and uh, just very few elements. Just what, what's in the scene is what really matters. So you can see the pole, you can see the player, you can see the, the things that you need to collect, you can see obstacles, but that's pretty much it. We don't have trees, we don't have buildings, we don't have cars. And of course, this depends a lot from game to game and from concept to concept. Uh, finally, the, the execution level. Hey, Pedro. So, yeah. Uh, just a quick uh, quick break for, for one quick question. By the way, once again, we just discussed with Pedro before, 24 years old and, and the founder, uh, very impressive. Don't remember what I did when I was 24, but definitely not having my gaming studio. Um, <laughs> but you mentioned the, the prototyping, uh, which I think it's uh, not our audience is, is interested in that as well. Uh, when you were talking about the different prototypes, how many of those do you test at the time? and what when when do you decide what's the right number? Should we should we increase the number of prototyping? Should we decrease it? Um, how does it look? Could you give us a bit more insights in that? Okay, okay, good question. So essentially, what what we do this depends a lot on on the on the seasonality of the year. So if we're at a time right now during Christmas or even a few weeks ago during Black Friday, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving where where the CPMs were were way higher. We oftentimes during those weeks decide to to hold back on the testing specifically of those games, but at the same time uh, we are always pumping out new prototypes to test. So we are averaging, as I mentioned, six prototypes per month. So at the same time, uh, we have uh, five uh, five develop six developers, sorry, and from the six developers we are working literally on six games at the same time. Um, so at this moment there are six games being worked on and uh, we test around one to two prototypes per week. But uh, the, the rules behind that are, of course, we also need to see from the market perspective if it's worth to do the test now, or if the, the, the time of, of the year, or if the, the occurrences are, will, will affect the, the CPIs in a negative way. Um, so, so, yeah. Right, very interesting. Uh, looking forward to discuss it further by the, uh, by the end of the, the webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, so back to what I was saying in the execution level. So at Vault Games, uh, we all focus a lot on the small details, and you might be thinking in hyper casual, the details are not that important. True, but at the same time, like when I mentioned these small details, these are, these are just things that take one or two minutes to, to integrate. So oftentimes, um, one of the developers puts a video on the Slack channel, which is where we communicate, and I see the video and I see that there's maybe the color there is wrong. You should add this or that, you should check the shadow quality, whatever. Um, and I oftentimes put a big list on, on the Slack of feedback. And from an outside perspective, you will see that list and be like, okay, but this is just a simple prototype. Why so many changes? But all of these changes are very simple, very small details that I believe in personally, and in the company also believe this, will make for a way better product in the end. Uh, the developer, when when doing the implementation of the, of the game and the art style, should always make justice to the to the to the game design document and the art mockups that were sent, uh, so that uh, what was thought out in the kickoff session makes sense um, once the game is published. Uh, we also do a lot of testing internally, so to test if there are any bugs, if the gameplay works, if the content is enough. All of those steps we do, and don't be afraid to iterate. So if you see a bug. And um, or if you think the gameplay is not good enough, don't don't be afraid to just iterate and spend one more day uh, working on on those small details. Uh, a quick case study here for the game I mentioned before, Perfect Fighter. So around the beginning of the year, we we launched uh, a video uh, on the Google Play Store for 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 this game. So uh, fighting game, tap and hold to to, to punch, release to dodge. Uh, we released this as a CPI test, and on Google Play we got thirty cents. 
not bad, but also not ideal. We we didn't think it would be good enough uh, to 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 go further with the game back then. What what we did was, since we believed so so much in this project and, and in the concept and everything, we decided to to do a quick iteration. And this is what we did. So basically, we changed the camera angle, made it more dynamic. So every time you change between enemies, the camera shifts to the other side. Uh, the color scheme is a little bit changed. The enemies only have one color. Uh, the black the background is blurred. And these are just, as I mentioned, these are just small details that all of these changes took way less than a day, maybe like two to three hours. And we managed to almost half, uh, to get the CPI almost to half, so 17 cents. Um, and after this, we thought that it would be worth it to iterate. And this is the final product nowadays. Uh, it's on the iOS app store with around 30 cents uh, CPI, a lot more levels, a lot more skins, everything. So very interesting case study here of what it, it changes in, in small iterations can do to a prototype. Uh, so what, what increases the probability of success? Um, so in order to try and increase our chances, we, we test as early as possible with CT, we, we try and if we have time, we test as early as possible to, to see if the concept is worth to put further work on it. So as you can see here on the right, a quick prototype video we did for a concept uh, game we called Bodyguard. So it's just this big blue character defending the VIPs um, from the red characters. And when he gets to the end, he just brutally sends them across the, the map. Um, so we just tested this prototype um, we did this in around one to two days for a quick CTR test. Again, I suggest fast prototyping. So we, we at Volt, we managed to do a quick CTR test in one to two days. For a CPI build, of course, depending on the concept, we, we do it uh, in around three to seven days. Um, and then if needed, we can do it a one retention build around four, four, 10 to 14 days, always depending on the complexity of the project itself. Uh, I suggest to, to iterate quickly. So if we see that the CTR is good enough to iterate, just get right on it because the market is always changing. What works today might not work the next week or the week after, um, uh, adapt to that. Um, also the final two suggestions here are to not grow an emotional connection to the game. So oftentimes we've had games where we've worked on them for weeks and weeks and weeks. It had good CPIs initially, but then the retention just wasn't good. And we thought, okay, let's, let's work. If it, we've spent so much time so far, why not waste or spend another one to two weeks on the prototype and see if we can get it to the right place? And that happened like two or three times. And then a few weeks ago, we made like a, a quick uh, recap of the, the past few months. And we noticed that from the time that we spent iterating on projects that didn't have the, the potential at that time, we could have worked on two to three to four prototypes uh, during those iteration times. So, if you see that the game is not working, don't be afraid to kill it. This this is just the the sad truth behind hyper casual that everyone needs to just uh, adjust. Um, and then uh, adapting to the market. So as we all know, the hyper casual market is very volatile. As Constantino was mentioning, um, it's ever changing. So nowadays we have simulation games, role playing games being very popular in hyper casual genre. Uh, but a few months ago, the more popular genres were others. If you compare. Um, Hyper casual in 2018 to, to nowadays, you, back then you saw 2D, 2D games with very simple art style that worked. Those games nowadays just won't work in terms of marketability. Uh, nowadays you need to make like polished, very polished 3D games uh, with good art that uh, applies to, to the market and make, makes customers and, and players satisfied. Uh, also adapting to the market in terms of the monetization techniques. So as Costantino mentioned, um, Nowadays, it's it's very much our, uh, rewarded video based. Back then, very interstitial interstitial based. So see what's working and what's not, and also adapt to the art. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the market is always changing and, and evolving, and the art needs to just adapt as well. So the art that worked uh, one year ago maybe doesn't work today. So you need to apply, get references from the top charts, see what works, see what doesn't. Um, yeah, that's just some of the suggestions. Um, and we reached the end. Thank you for. For listening, uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me in my email. And uh, also, if you want, visit our website. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pedro, Pedro, for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, maybe before we go to the next presentation, I will ask uh, uh, one question. There was actually a very interesting question, uh, like from your experience, uh, like in, in terms of how you work, like how long it takes for you to create a uh, like hyper casual game from idea to the release? Yeah, so so of course, it, it depends on on the complexity of the title. Again, um, if you're talking about a CPI build from ideation, if we have the the, the GD, if you have if we start getting the ideas ready, 
um, the idea process takes around less than a day. Then to go, get it straight to the, to the CPI build, maybe like five uh, five days. And then if you want to, to talk about uh, a day one build where we have shop system, mm -hmm. dozens of levels, skins, etc. So we, we are talking there about more content, more work for the artists, more work for the developers, more game design work as well. So there we can talk about a further 10 to 15 days. I think in general to have a good um, prototype to test uh, retention, uh, specifically day one, or even day seven, we would be talking about uh, 14 to 21 days uh, of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, for the answer. And of course, stay, stay with us till the end uh, for like a further and deeper uh, the discussion. Okay, thank you. And thank you again. And for now, let's invite our next speaker. Uh, 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 and of course, like, you know, uh, please, uh, Add uh, still the questions to the to the slider. We'll like you know touch them during the session and at the end of the session. Right now, let's invite to the stage Heba Gurguis. Hello. What's your name? Yeah, uh, my name is a bit hard to so <laughs> pronounce sometimes. <laughs> Gurguis. Yeah. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Good. So Heba good. is product and partnership manager in Boombin, and uh, she'll be talking about the process behind the testing and growth of hyper casual game. Yeah, uh, so a quick intro about me. I'm Heba. I've been uh, started actually my career purely in hyper casual. So I think one of the first uh, people. Uh, it's been three years that I purely work on hyper casual. I started off uh, doing a lot of UA monetization. Um, and then now I work on product, product strategy, everything that has to do with monetization. Uh, yeah, so I am basically working on the publishing team to help with everything uh, that has to do with. Uh, making uh, the game uh, like uh, be a hit game. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very uh, big goal, but yeah, that's my role. So testing, process, growth, uh, etc. So let's dive in. Um, so today we're going to discuss um, the process. Uh, I'll, I'll share some tips and a bit of how we do things at Boombit. And uh, yeah, and a bit of game design. So let's go. Uh, so yeah, we again like goes to uh, a lot of the points mentioned before so test early because we want to save dev time right uh, we start very early on with very simple videos and uh, do ctr tests super early uh, uh, on uh, ctr test is a very simple 15 second video uh, with just the key uh, things in the game and just to get the player's attention. We include basic instructions on how to play the game. The, vo the focus at this stage is really to validate the core mechanic and not the award-winning art. And we don't wanna, our team doesn't spend too much time at this stage uh, reiterating or we just wanna see if the if the core mechanic has a potential um, at, this, at this point. For example, uh, we want to find the best CTR, and I will show you two different videos and how the CTR was completely different. Uh, so this is the first one. We've got a game here. You see? Yeah. And then... Uh, and this is the second video. So the first video had a CTR of 0.74%, and the second one had a 4.7%. So imagine of scale and profitability of the game. So at this stage, we're also uh, iterating a lot on creatives. We also do the Luna Labs for this, like um, in terms of video variations, because you can create like hundreds of variations. So. Uh, when a game passes like a for initial test, we already uh, set up some uh, like uh, campaigns with uh, 15 ad sets with a lot of variations so we can actually identify uh, the best CTRs uh, at this point. The metrics we're aiming for, a, yeah, we need to have some kind of a benchmark. Again, it's, it's flexible and it depends a lot on the season because as uh, Pedro mentioned, you've got like Black Friday, you've got Christmas and the behavior, um, and the performance is completely uh, like it, it changes. Uh, so for, for example, like 4% CTR is roughly around 20, 20 cent CPI. But again, this is not uh, uh, like uh, absolute. Um, 
also it's very important to consider the genre of the hyper casual game because if it's an asmr game we would be looking at much lower uh, um, a cpi benchmarks versus a hyper idle game which has a much much longer ltv therefore we can have a higher uh, cpi benchmark so the the iterating we iter iterate iterate all the time so because we we want to find a good cpi right this is the the main goal so we iterate on themes and assets so at this point our when a game when we have a first good cpi test and we see potential then our team like the boombit publishing team starts to actually work on the game so they our game designers uh, start uh, working on on more advanced gdds and uh, so we want to test like mixed the uh, mechanics so uh, we want to work on the ui ux because now we see potential at the beginning we don't uh, invest our resources until we validate uh, at least a first uh, cpi test it's also very important from a uh, UA side uh, to look at the store conversion ratio because this is something that some people uh, forget when they're doing tests uh, sometimes or they just update any screenshots and say like whatever we just care about the CPI so just uh, the video but actually the conversion rate uh, on the store has a huge impact on the on the CPI and the potential of the game so it's, it's very important at this early stage to be looking at this uh, this and are your assets uh, the icon uh, etc uh, the another thing to to bear in mind is the target audience because this can skew the CPI. If it's like a nail game that's purely female focused, we should have different uh, CPI benchmark than a male uh, focused uh, hyper casual game because, as we know, like all the uh, the female audience tends to have a better LTV, you know, <laughs> because we like to consume a more luxury brands so you've got better cpms in the in there so yeah it's it's just another thing to keep in mind also it has to do with validating the game so even at this early stage it's important to look at this uh, audience uh, factor so yeah i just wanted to add this here because hyper casual is all about speed and efficiency right uh, uh, as pedro mentioned they're prototyping like super fast you need to uh, test early, see results early, and if it fails, you kill it right away. No emotional attachment, again, as uh, Pedro uh, mentioned before. So it's it's really all about this uh, speed testing. If it's, if, if it's validated, we move fast. If it's not, we kill it right away, like uh, we don't think. The last piece uh, here, when it comes to process and testing, it's uh, going early for monetization tests. And this is something that hasn't been, um, it's been around recently. So I would say two years ago, publishers were not really uh, doing that. And they were purely focusing on day one, which was the holy grail. But right now, uh, it's shifted. And we, we go super early to monetization tests whenever we can. Because again, like if, if my day one retention is not according to the good day one retention, it's not according to the benchmark. But I still have very good. Uh, LTV on, on day zero and day one, and then I don't care if I break even or I can be ROI uh, positive as fast as I can, then it's it's okay, right? Um, so we it's very important at this stage to look at ARPU, which is average revenue per user, to look at the impressions per session for, for a rewarded video and, and interstitial, uh, to also look at retention post uh, ads implementation, because we know like when, when the, when we have the we have we have our ads in there, the retention gets really affected. So it's very important for the game designer to have this early uh, idea about the potential drop in retention due to ads monetization. Another very important point, which is the interstitial to RV impressions per user in total, and basically the. The uh, RV, it shows us the rewarded video, uh, shows us the demand and appeal of uh, of like RV locked content uh, features. And it also validates like th that the game economy is working when you have like the RV uh, claim times three. And uh, that's, that's very important from a game design perspective. The interstitial uh, uh, per, like per user in total, it shows uh, the, the length of the like the how would you say, like session time. Uh, and again, that's that's very important in the monetization side. So together, this uh, 
this point, it gives us an idea of it's like a good prediction of a potential like our pool, and then it helps uh, game designers like tweak specific things in the game to to reach a certain ratio of based on how we uh, the 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 CPI and how we want to improve the LTV. The last one, which is the percentage of users reaching half of the funnel, or if it's a 10 level game, then it's the one at the end of the fifth level, because basically it shows us the overall difficulty curve and success rate uh, if it's too easy and too hard. And it's, it shows us if a game has issues early on, so why are, are, aren't our players continuing? So we can identify issues, act fast, and change them. And it also shows if onboarding is, is good enough. It can also be a signal uh, for that. So. That's more like a bit uh, in a nutshell, uh, everything that has to do with the process. And please, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. It's very hard to, to put everything in the presentation. Um, on the, the second part of the presentation, it's just a very quick, uh, some tips uh, for game design and add experience. Um, hey, yeah. Emma. Yes. <laughs> I must say, I was listening to your presentation as, as it was the previous one, and I'm thinking to myself, hyper casual is a very brutal business. Just keep on yeah. killing the game. No emotional yeah. attachment here, right? Look, there was a, a, <laughs> a great overview of the metrics here. Um, but it feels to me like there's a lot, right? So we have the CTRs, the CPAs, we have, of course, the whole monetization side. If you would, could give a tip to our audience here, um, how to structure that all? So what in the end would be the winning metrics? What which one would be the one that we should we can let's say put in a second tier? Um, where where should our focus be, or how we should, should we structure this process, or how do you structure this process? Okay, so in terms of structure, uh, let's uh, let's divide the testing phase. So we have a CPI, uh, CPI, and if possible, a day one retention combined. Uh, then we would have like commoditization phase, right, and a scale. Uh, phase where we can actually start scaling based on the results of the monetization. In terms of uh, purely at the first stage, you purely want to look at CPI, right? You want to really get the lowest CPI possible. You want to make sure your creative team is working like uh, crazy, getting those ideas in there and like making sure that you lower your CPI as much as you can. Uh, then on the monetization, Side, to be honest, it's purely like, yeah, it's super brutal, but it's again, it's, it's ROI, right? That's that's what we like. That's why I say like uh, before the retention uh, it was very important, but now people have really pushed those monetization tests early on because they want to see profitability uh, very very yeah. early on. I would say at this stage it's it's ROI and also the from a game design uh, side, which is like the interstitial to RV impressions and the impressions per session, because this is the point where you can actually improve ev to like uh, the versions of your game so if you if you're seeing a low impressions per session then you want to okay i we will tweak a bit the levels we will have shorted levels so we can uh, be more aggressive in the interstitial strategy for example so this this is the phase where we're we're actually targeting to boost our ltv and i of course i want to improve and we have a times two ltv um right. and then at the scale uh, phase i think the goals uh, of course, in terms of KPIs uh, from, from a UA monetization side, it's ROI. Mm -hmm. So ROI at scale. So making sure that uh, my test campaigns are spending uh, across different networks, because at this point you're already exploring like different, uh, like you're diversifying your media mix and making sure that the game is, has a good marketability as uh, on Facebook. And uh, yes, uh, I agree that um, the goal should be more like and not really pushing. Right, thank you. Um, so just a quick follow-up question to that, because um, you mentioned all those metrics. Uh, if you would share them between developer, so who's responsible for, for those metrics from the developer side, and which one is more uh, into the publisher uh, side, or is it a shared responsibility? I think uh, in terms of, uh, so I'm, I'm talking again about Boombit. I don't know how other publishers, I don't want to speak for everyone in the industry. So um, so it's more, it's our on our side, like all of this, uh, as soon as the game enters uh, to our, of course, uh, we work with very experienced devs and we really appreciate the feedback and a lot of them 
uh, share a lot and propose how to improve like impressions per session, how to improve session time, uh, have a lot of input input on the ad strategy. So, but I would say we, the team, our publishing team is the one taking care of this. Uh, once the game enters into this phase, we are really like everyone is hands-on from game design on the product side, on the UA side. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Cool. Same here. OK, so we can continue. OK, so it's uh, be done very soon. Uh, so the tips, very quick tips for game design and also someone add experience. So here is some basic elements of level design. I'm sure a lot of people watching already know it, but I just want to put it in there. So basically, we would, uh, like it's uh, if you see, look at the difficulty curve, with time, it just it has to be, uh, you know, just the way you see it uh, here. The In the level one and two, you teach the players the basic controls from levels three to 10. It's like more of a feel good, like simple progress. And when you pass level 10, you add in like new obstacles, mechanics, but you always need to follow the, the rules of level one, two. You just basically give the player time uh, to learn. The, the second more interesting part, which has to do with like working on different versions of the game, and this is this goes back to uh, the process of how uh, we work. So here you have like the player blocks, right? There's like cohorts of, of users that our game designers, uh, they look at and also on the UA side, but here it's more game design focused. And this is the data that's best, like this is the data that's best to change, uh, like to improve a game, like from a version to another version. So you look at the level churn, you look at the play, player churn, uh, because they have the most impact on uh, retention and LTV. So just by looking at this, you can already, like the game designer can already uh, find areas of improvement and therefore improve for attention, improve LTV, and then making the game have a better chance uh, for, for success. Uh, again, I want to mention one point that in hyper casual, we usually track seven days of, of, of revenue, uh, of sorry, seven days of the, of the funnel, because again, we want to monetize our users as early as possible. So, no one's looking after day seven. Honestly, uh, we look at day two already to validate, and day three for me uh, personally is like the where we already want to be ROI positive and actually making a lot of profits. So yeah, so again, at this stage, it's more like a tweak how to balance like player churn and monetization so that we can have the sweet spot, uh, which uh, yeah. It's not that easy. It's easy, easier said than done, but sometimes we reach it. And I think the hits, the big, big hits, are the ones that manage to really get this um, sweet spot uh, properly. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> here it's uh, about the ad experience, right? A lot of shit uh, comments uh, on on App Store about like ads and how it affects the user experience, therefore affects conversion rate on the store, and it's like such a big hassle. So it's very important to to focus on this like ad strategy, monetization strategy, very early on on the game design in the core loop of the game. Um, so, for example, like uh, the ad experience needs to make sense, you know, to what's happening in the game, you know, it needs to, uh, it's, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's said like that and the rewarded videos just, it's, it's very important to, to think uh, how to leverage rewarded videos in a hyper casual game because again hyper casual games tend to not have so many features right it's not like a puzzle game where you can like access different uh, worlds or unlock uh, new candy and uh, i don't know it's super simple right it's a very simple core mechanic and level progression is quite basic versus other games so so this part is one of the most important parts because again we want to monetize by more by rewarded video because a higher CPM, so they tend to have higher LTV. So this is much better for the publisher and also for the developers because we're making more profit. Uh, so there's also like, feeding this to, to the idea of being creative when it comes to 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 how to implement rewarded videos. So we got like a, a lot of like rewarded mini games uh, in the within the game. Uh, like uh, the example uh, here in uh, in uh, Swipe Fight, 
which is like a slap challenge mini game uh, that offers you an uh, extra reward, or in this case, it's coins to to get like new access the shop, uh, etc., uh, or to revive your character. This could be could be another thing. Another side is like rewarded missions uh, where you're for different types uh, of game. So yeah, making sure to leverage like all the areas possible to in the game to to get as many rewarded videos uh, per user per session uh, as we can. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. Thank you, thank you, Heba, for uh, for a very thank interesting you. presentation. Uh, and of course, like you know, before even we, we go maybe to to the uh, to the like you no know, further discussion, uh, I, I would like to ask, may ask you like from your experience, uh, what has the like the biggest impact? Uh, what actually has the biggest impact on getting uh, like lower or higher uh, CPI in terms of hyper casual games? Uh, to, <laughs> to be honest, it's it's all about. Uh, I mean, it's all about being relevant, right? And mm -hmm. how the games speak to the users, and how it's relevant to pop culture as well. So this is like something we're seeing. Like, given like an example uh, right now, the Among Us, right? This game like, became huge, and we we tested a couple of games that had like the similar camera or the similar view of this game. So they tend to have very low CPI right now. So I would say this, this is one key factor. Again, there's no like absolute uh, answer, but if you have a shit creative, you know it. Like if the creative doesn't show how, how to basic of how to win, how to lose, what's the real value to the user, it's then, you know, it's a bad creative. So I would say the basic thing is to really show the gameplay, show the how to win, show how to lose because Again, like like uh, users right now, we don't have time, you know. And there's if you see something that you don't understand, you're just gonna, you know, like what is this? I'm not gonna click on it. So that's one key thing. And I would say the other thing is to stay relevant because on those kind of platforms, uh, it's all about talking to the rights users, right? Talking to Snap users is different than uh, advertising on, for example, Facebook. It's different advertising on TikTok. So also being creating, do, like producing creatives that are platform specific, meaning that are audience specific. And this can really help drive uh, lower CPIs. Thank you. And then we can go, I think, to the to the like you know our discussion. So let's invite uh, uh, Pedro and Costantino. <laughs> Hello, guys. <laughs> OK, so maybe like starting from the like for the first question, uh, like there is actually a very interesting uh, question, uh, uh, probably may, mainly to like Pedro, but I think, you know, it, like, you know, to like Casantino and, and Heba. Uh, how much inspiration do you take from games you noticed know, during soft launch, uh, but not not like launch global yet by publisher? Yeah, you you see that some games are kind of published, so they're actually they're loose, but you don't still have like like full information. In, okay, do they have success or not? Uh, is just the start or like? And in yeah. general, how, how much inspiration you take from the games that are existing uh, uh, today or like? They were pizza yeah. Pizza. Okay, yeah, I, I can start at least from, from my side. The, it's tricky when, when you see a game on the top charts because 99% of the times, if you see a game published globally by a publisher, it means that it, it has good metrics. The other 1% is if the publisher or the company just wants to do it for, for marketing, which is possible. Um, but when, when we see games in soft launch or in store glide, we take them. Um, not like we, we don't take them as like, okay, this is a hit. So we, we need to take inspiration from this because sometimes they release a game and they are like us a lot of times just testing a concept. Maybe they have, maybe we see a game on, on so in soft launch in store glide or new games daily, and it might have $2 CPI. You never know. So you need to you pay attention to, to the inspiration and to the references that you take from these games in soft launch. But, uh, but yeah, both questions, both sides are tricky. You need to take them, because at the same time, the games that are on the top charts, if they are there, it also means that 
that that spot is already taken so you the inspiration you can take is is a lot but at the same time you need to like think how to do this better or how to mix this with another concept or something so yeah that's that's my take on this Yeah, maybe I can add something here. Uh, yeah, I agree with Pedro for sure. Uh, I think in general, uh, we, we consider here um, soft launch as potentially already having uh, thousands of users, for example. Uh, in that case, I think for sure the right way to, to deal with this is for sure there's something interesting to take from it. Uh, but at the same time, it's really a bad idea to get too close uh, and, you know, like to try to almost copy it because obviously, uh, you you are late on on that specific game because the concept is really scaling uh, so the best thing to do there is taking like what's interesting out of it and potentially apply it to another theme or another or another game another mechanic as for sure there's something good to take inspiration from but at the same time you don't want to split your audience with the exact same game already going into the charts so so that would be my my view on that great thanks guys um so the other question that's, uh, that's, uh, is, is right here is how do you follow the trends on Instagram? You mentioned uh, a lot that's about the pop culture, about, you know, you, you work in a hit driven market, right? So uh, basically you need to watch for, for those trends. Um, and I would add a little follow up to this question as well. Does branding matter in hyper casual or, or is it completely irrelevant into what, uh, if the, the game is a hit or not? So. Um, yeah, a, a bit of the how do you follow trends, I think, in general, but also on Instagram. And also, if, if, if branding is something you consider at all in this genre, or this is something uh, not really relevant for your, your category. Uh, I can I can answer the following trends. So uh, internally, we've got uh, like uh, people that are working as creative analysts uh, at Boombit, who basically, they're, they're their goal is to every day scan the internet like everywhere like uh, Netflix, Nine Gag, uh, TikTok, uh, everything, Reddit, you know, and uh, and tell us what's what's there, you know. Basically, tell the game design team, the ideation team, to basically this team feeds into this idea. So it's it's a, it's a like you need someone for that, and it's it takes a lot of time, right? Because you cannot just do it like for 15 minutes because you're not going to get too deep into the internet you really need to be uh, on youtube you need to spend hours and and that's uh, that's how we we follow them so we actually have people that that do that in the team and for in my opinion in terms of uh, branding and also costa pedro it'd be very good to hear yours uh right now i don't think it's uh, we don't we don't care about branding uh, for, for me from a ua monetization perspective purely um, yeah, um, Costa. I don't know if you want to go first. I I, I can go first. Sure, go uh, from the 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 trends point of view, we don't have the same tools and and staff as Boombit does. But uh, from from our side, we just we just scout and do that uh, hard work. Uh, we mostly what what we see is mostly on on TikTok, for example, because it's very popular. Um, we see we we scout a lot TikTok as well as Nine Gag and as I mentioned Instagram. So yeah, we just see that, see the number of likes, see what's the appeal, see if there's more videos like that. And that's what we do. And regarding branding, I agree with Heva. I think uh, at this stage, maybe for some concepts, for more hybrid casual concepts, it might be relevant, but for more hyper casual, I don't think it's relevant, at least at this stage, that's my point of view. Yeah, I can I can add to that very quickly. I, I, I align with the, uh, with the other two guests here with me. Uh, I would say that uh, for for sure, I think with branding, what's tricky is that on one side, I mean, either you have huge brands uh, like that are extremely globally appealing, but are obviously very expensive as well, right? So that's uh, that's one point. Uh, or on the other side, if you have a brand that is not extremely appealing or very popular, what the risk that you have is that you might add that brand and users that are used to very simple things in hyper casual might get scared of, from of that brand, right? Being like, I don't know what it is. If it was not there, I would have played the game, but I'm, I'm not relating to this, so I'm not going to download it. So I think sometimes branding can probably bring something more to it, but of course it would be very popular brands that everyone should know. At least the hyper casual uh, uh, sphere. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe quickly one more question on that side, because we're moving back to the actual business. We have a question from Primos. 
Um, so what's the target profit margin, if there is one, as in percentage of total revenue um, for a hyper casual game in its lifetime? Do you work with such metrics? And if so, um, what's the target profit margin? Uh, actually, we, we don't we don't work like that, right? Uh, this we don't have a target profit margin because, again, I think it also depends a lot on the type of publisher. Some publishers look for growth, uh, like pure revenue growth, versus others that want to focus on profitability, and it depends on also the type of game uh, that we have. But I would say, like, uh, if uh, if I target uh, like the better, you know, because our goal right away is like lowest CPI possible and making sure that we, we break even, right? Because again, uh, it's the it's not, we don't have, a, if a game has 5% profit margin, for example, or 10% and another one, it has like 35, we're not gonna kill the 5% one, we would still scale uh, both. Uh, so I don't think there's uh, just uh, an absolute profit margin that we'd be looking at. Uh, at least a boom, but for the hyper casual uh, team. Yeah, uh, personally, I don't have much to add to what uh, Heather just said. So, yeah, she, she nailed it. Let <laughs> <laughs> me move, move to, like, to, the, to the market uh, uh, question. Uh, there is like, we, we see actually in the, in the recent quarters, like uh, the data, at least based on the Apani. It, it shows that around 60% of the market is like taken by 10, uh, uh, 10 main players and then like, you know, the, the other ones. Uh, and like, how do you see the, the future of hyper casual for the future? Do you see like stronger and stronger concentration of, uh, of that market? Like, you know, a bigger and bigger part of the market will be taken by a smaller number of companies or like it's, it's vice versa. You see actually more and more diversity coming out of the market in the future. Maybe I can answer this one. Uh, I think both, actually. Uh, as already it's been a trend recently, it's going to continue with a lot of M&A. So those big players you were mentioning are acquiring uh, studios and so and growing in size. And at the same time, you have a lot of new studios coming, right? Uh, so I think it's developing on both sides. A uh, lot of new players arriving, but at the same time, the big ones, uh, like merging with these smaller ones as well. So that would general direction. Yeah, for, for, from my side, I think, uh, yeah, we, we also noticed that a lot of the market is dominated by these big players. I think what, what they add, uh, it's because they, they work a lot with smaller studios and all that. So I think that's one of the advantages and also the publishing power that they that they bring to the table. Yeah, I just I just want to add one thing about the M&A, like um, just basically like the recent acquisition by of Rolik by Zynga and how this can relate to the IDFA and basically uh, building this ecosystem of users that you track internally. So I think we'll see more and more uh, acquisitions of uh, by very big publishers purely because of that. Like, not purely, but it can be very relevant because uh, when it comes to IDFA, basically, uh, when you will be able to track users across your whole ecosystem, and then basically there will be a, a publisher X user ID, you know, it's, there won't be a IDFA for the user. It's not something uh, uh, global. So it will be very publisher specific. And the more traffic you have, the, the better you'll be able to create like a profile for those uh, users. Okay, have I? You said it first. Uh, it wasn't. It won't be on me. But you, you, you said the magic word. So I let's uh, play a little bit of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. of, 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 uh, of, of fortune telling. So basically, hyper casual mm. since 2021 in the post IDFA world. Um, where they will go? Uh, will they stay, especially on, on iOS? And, and what's your take on that? Uh, how, how you guys preparing for that? What do you think? Okay. About that? Yes, hypercasual will stay because there's a lot of those scare scenarios that like publishers uh, of hypercasual will just die, you know, and things like that. So we're staying. Um, and my take on this, it's really, uh, it's going to be all about data teams, like very strong BI, uh, how to merge uh, the Apple Apple's SK ad network and the data. Uh, we are receiving a user, some uh, ID, user ID data, like device, uh, uh, like, uh, um, 
OS, uh, some data we receive, we would still receive from the ad networks and the attribution uh, that uh, that every publisher will use, and combining this to create more powerful models. So, for me, the the winners, and especially when it comes to iOS and IDFA, are going to be the publishers that are going to be uh, still be able to bid and acquire users and optimize uh, at this granularity through uh, much stronger uh, BI uh, systems. Uh, so that's that's one side when it comes to very uh, who if if, if uh, some publishers really don't focus on this and don't develop uh, their their BI stack further, I think they will might lose a lot, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the the performance optimization at scale um, for games. And uh, then also another take would be uh, very a lot more focus on Android. Uh, when it comes to UA strategy and really boosting that. So this, if what if everyone's bidding on Android right now? And like, uh, what if the CPI on Android goes up? It's becoming more competitive Then maybe Android. This is one of my theories, but uh, I have no idea if it's going to happen or not. But what if Android CPMs actually improve, you know? So I don't know uh, if that answers a bit the question. <laughs> Uh, and then, like, anyone would, would like to add something or? Okay, so uh, there is the question. Uh, I, I understand, like, uh, uh, what game engines do you see, like, is used most often uh, to, to product such games? In this case, we have, like, a question about instant games, but we, we kind of, you know, understanding it's about hyper casual and those small games in general. At, at, at Vault Games, we we only use Unity um, because we think it's the more the most efficient one, the one that uh, is broader uh, to all developers. There's also two other options. One of them we don't think is is too too appealing because it's more complex, which is Unreal. But the other one, and uh, it has been rising in popularity, and it's very low code, is Buildbox, which I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of it. Um, it's it's a very interesting tool that uh, we might explore soon. Uh, it allows for faster development and simpler development. Uh, I suggest you guys uh, checking it out. Um, so yeah, but at Vault, we, we only use at this stage uh, Unity. Uh, OK, thank you. And then maybe, uh, like, if you uh could maybe add a few like you know uh, points are like you know how in general you you work together like you know for example like you know how uh, uh how do you see this uh, uh cooperation of this you know creative side and this uh, processing you know how how it how it works in in practice in kind of okay should I start? Okay. Uh, so yeah, from our side, we we've had lots of experience working with with um, publishers. So we we first began working with publishers. I personally first began working with publishers around two years ago, and back then um, there was um, the, the the I don't want to get into too much detail, but the 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 the, uh, the terms were not very beneficial for developers. But we we've seen a big change uh, around a year ago. In that, in terms that, in terms of uh, payments for developers, revenue share, all of the terms that uh, make developers feel in a more comfortable position. Um, our relationship with our partners is very good. So at Volt, we we value a lot the communication between partners. Um, we also value a lot of the feedback. So we know that a lot a lot of the expertise, even though we build games, a lot of the expertise is on the publisher side, right? Because they have big teams of various people, as Ebo was mentioning, Boombit has people that are, are are focused on checking new trends on TikTok and Instagram and Nangex. So you, you, from that, you can only see that uh, they really have a lot of value to add to the, to the studios. So I think at the same time, it's also really good because the, the publishers, most of them, I think all of them, give us a lot of creative freedom. So besides the fact that we provide most of the ideas that then we work on, um, they also allow us to take freedoms for for the art style for for the gameplay and they provide a lot of valuable feedback as well so i think it's always a very positive uh, relationship in general yeah i pretty much align with pedro on this uh, for sure i think it's always a matter of uh, working together like every time a decision is taken we should share that decision pretty much between developer and publisher 
Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much the, the way to, to go when working as a partner in hyper casual for sure. Great. Um, I think uh, probably last question, um, at least from my side. So uh, just following up on, on what you guys mentioned, uh, you're not only working in a hit driven industry, but an extremely fast industry. So to have this process in terms of um, you know game dev uh, in connection with the um, growth and creative team is, is absolutely crucial. Any tips for our audience here, um, how to set up this process or how, how do you do that yourself? Uh, in terms of to make sure that it's seamless, that, they're, they're, that they don't work in silos, um, and if any end tips on that note, that'll be also extremely helpful. Uh, yeah, from from our side, to 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 have um, like a, a faster development uh, thing um, process and a better development process, we we divide the team. Uh, usually, at at the start, we decided to divide the team into two squads. So, to as as you know, in terms of the the whole COVID situation, we're all working from home. So in order to, to increase communication, we divided the team into two small squads so that the communication inside each, each squad is improved. Um, and we noticed, uh, we did that in around June, July, and we noticed ever since then that the productivity increased and the communication increased and uh, everything just got better. Um, we know that there are other ways that can be done. So you can divide into micro teams. So if you have five developers and five artists, for example, you have five micro teams each, each micro team of having one developer and one artist. So from our side, we divide into two squads. Each squad communicates in itself. And then uh, weekly, we, commun we communicate all. Um, and on Slack channel, all communication is always there. But we've seen productivity uh, spike uh, with, with this division. Yeah, the expert has spoken. So. <laughs> Can only allow that. Great, thank you very much. And and, and in this case, like you know, uh, following on that, uh, uh, there is the question like, what is the ideal compilation of the team in terms of experience and skills? Like you know, number of uh, developers versus artists, uh, like make the prototype. Do you have any kind of you know tips around that? Yeah, probably. Yeah, for, for, from yeah. from our perspective, to, to work in one prototype. All, uh, in terms of development, you only need one. Of course, if it's a more complicated prototype, you need more, of course, but uh, um, only one developer is enough. And then maybe uh, add a 3D artist. In, in hyper-casual, 2D artists are not that important. Um, it's more of a 3D artist to make the environment, to make the character, to make everything. Um, so yeah, I would say you need uh, a semi-experienced uh, Unity developer plus uh, a 3D artist uh, like 30% of the time because most of the work behind a hyper casual prototype is for the developer because that's usually what takes the most work from our perspective. Thank you. And then probably question to Constantino. Uh, Constantino, like based on your uh, presentation, there's a question you mentioned that some mechanics are possible due to new Unity features. What are those functions? So yeah, to be honest, I think the question might be more for Pedro actually, because more linked to development. I mean, from what I from what I know, basically, it's just like some new Unity plugins that were available uh, for for games. Like I remember uh, when this one in particular came out, uh, everyone would start making like uh, untangling slash cable games where you have to plug uh, and unplug stuff, etc. Uh, so in, from a technical point of view, I don't know, Pedro, if you have any anything to add here. No, it's it's pretty much what you said. So we we noticed that at a certain time this year we sort, for example, as you mentioned, like untangling in the ropes. So there was a big trend there, and we saw that on the Unity asset store, for example, which is very valuable for us. There's assets that allow for developers to more easily integrate these features, such as rope rope physics, right? So yeah, um, besides ropes, there's also other features and plugins that that can be installed in Unity that can help development. Wow. Um, I think from my side, thank you so much for an hour and a half of this bomb of hyper casual information bomb. Uh, that was fantastic to hear. Um, I hope our, our audience also enjoyed. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. It's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For like thank thank you, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if thank anyone you. has any questions, uh, please like 
messages on LinkedIn if uh, yep. or anything. All right. Sure. Okay. All right. And of course, uh, I would like again, like in everyone, to uh, to check out the Game Camp website, uh, where you can see actually uh, some another webinars happening in the next uh, weeks. Uh, one of that is actually announced already. That will be happening next week. Uh, that will be around uh, funding. So how to actually talk to the VC? How the VC uh, that invest in gaming uh, work? How they actually operate? So that actually should be really interesting for anyone that wants to either open the the the, the gaming company or like fund it uh, to to actually get the better growth. Uh, so Are and Harry, they actually they will show the. Uh, this perspective, and then Stefan will actually show the how actually the investment change uh, his company and then his life uh, in in general. So thank you, thank you again for for your time. Uh, please uh, share us uh, uh, feedback with us uh, on the uh, comment sections uh, uh, under the video. You actually you have the link to the. Uh, Questionnaire, please actually fill out because then it gives us information if that if such webinars are useful for you, should we continue that? Uh, uh, how actually you can actually even improve it. With that, thank you again, and I hope you to see you in the next weeks again.